Hello and welcome to Baijo's Exam Prep IAS. In today's session, let's discuss the important economic articles that have appeared from 19th of February to 25th of February 2022. Let's begin the discussion. The first very important article is related to FTA policy recalibration. In simple terms, in recent times, Government of India has started reworking on the free trade agreements that it has signed with various other countries. Now, what is the point of this particular discussion? In the last couple of months and in the last one week, I am pretty sure you must have seen in the newspaper, there is a lot of discussion related to the trade agreements that Indian government has signed not only in the recent past with other countries, but also in the last one and a half decades with many of the trading partners. Now, some of you might be scratching your head and thinking, sir, what do you mean by this particular FTA? We keep on reading this, we keep on hovering over this particular term very often in the newspaper without understanding what is this particular concept of free trade agreement. In the context of economics, you will come across the idea called as economic integration. Okay? Economic integration, that is the global market which consists of various countries will start integrating in terms of trading, in terms of investment, in terms of movement of a labor, etc. Generally, the economic integration starts with preferential trade agreement, PTA. Then after this, there is a free trade agreement. Then after this, there is a common market, then the customs union and finally, economic union. Okay? The final integration will be economic union. After that, there is a political integration. Do not worry about this under the concept of economics. Now, basically, in case of free trade agreement, focus on the FTA because that is there in the newspapers very often. India has signed multiple free trade agreements with many of the trading partners. For example, in this particular article itself, the authors quote that India has signed agreements with countries such as Japan, South Korea, Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bhutan, Mauritius and even the 10 grouping nations that is ASEAN. Now, should you remember this? My recommendation, please do. Because in the last couple of months or let's say last couple of weeks itself, India signed a comprehensive economic partnership agreement, CEPA, with United Arab Emirates, which I will discuss in some time. In addition to this, there is also a discussion with respect to United Kingdom regarding signing an FTA. We are also negotiating with Australia and we want to sign a free trade agreement with them also. Now, some of you will simply say, sir, hang on a minute. You told us about PTA, FTA, etc. But there is no mention about the comprehensive economic partnership anywhere in these particular terms. Essentially, the concept of PTA means what? Understand this. Let us understand the uh, FTA first. Then we will look at the concept of CEPA. Under the free trade agreement, two trading partners or two or more trading partners will come together and they will try to reduce the tariff as well as non-tariff barriers on most of the goods and services that are being traded amongst them. That is, imagine there are two countries A and B. Okay, Imagine there are two countries A and B and these particular two countries are trading, let us say, 100 goods and services between them. Now, if I cover, let us say, all the 100 goods and services, if I cover 90 percentage of them, if I cover even 65 percentage of them, right, it is essentially referring to a substantial amount of a trade which is conducted between both of these countries. And whenever you talk about free trade agreement, that is exactly what they are trying to do. Under the PTA, they generally focus on very small volume of trade or very small part of the trade. Whereas, under the context of free trade agreement, a substantial part, majority of the trade that is conducted between both of the countries or let us say group of the countries will be covered under free trade agreement. That is a very important difference between PTA and FTA. And before signing this particular FTA, generally the countries sign one more type of a scheme or let us say agreement which is called as early harvest scheme or early harvest agreement. Now, some of you will simply say, sir, you are saying they will sign FTA, but before signing FTA, they will sign early harvest agreement. What do you mean by this? Let us take the same example. 
both A and B want to sign an agreement which covers let us say 100 goods or 100 items. Now, it will take long period of time for them to negotiate and come to a conclusion what kind of a tariff they are supposed to have regarding all of these particular 100 commodities. But out of 100 commodities, let us say around 15 commodities, both of the countries can come to an agreement very, very soon, very quickly. And when both of these particular countries can come to an agreement regarding tariffs or let us say non-tariff barriers on these particular 15 commodities, they will generally sign an agreement which is called as early harvest agreement. It is simply a precursor, I repeat it, it is simply a precursor to signing an FTA. Why? Negotiating and signing an FTA takes time and there are certain low hanging fruits, easier areas for which both of the countries generally agree and these areas would be covered and we will sign an agreement called as a early, early harvest agreement or early harvest scheme. Now, what is the CEPA? There are two terms here. Many of the books will refer to the agreements in the form of comprehensive economic partnership, right? Comprehensive econo economic partnership agreement or else they will also use one more name, comprehensive economic cooperation agreement, CPA, CCA. These are special types of free trade agreements. I can understand this. These are a one step further within the free trade agreements itself. Generally in the free trade agreements, focus is on the trade of goods and services. Whereas in the context of CEPA or CCA, the agreements rather than focusing only on the goods and services, they will start focusing on investments. They will start focusing on intellectual property rights, human labor, etc. Again, it depends from one agreement to another agreement. But in simple terms, I can say that the coverage under CEPA as well as CCA or the scope of both of them is much broader, much wider compared to a simple free trade agreement. Now, in the recent times, India has signed a CEPA with United Arab Emirates. Now, what is the point of discussion in this particular article? In the last one and a half decade, India has signed agreements with many of these particular countries. And whenever such agreements are signed, a simple object of the agreement is that the trade between both of the countries should increase and both of the countries should benefit out of this particular trade. But what has actually happened in the context of India? If you can see this particular graph, they have shown what has happened to trade deficit of India with the majority of these particular free trading agreements or these trading partners between financial, 11, financial year 11 to financial year 21. And in simple terms, you can see that the value of imports that we have done from these particular countries is much higher compared to value of exports we have done. In essence or in a nutshell, what I am uh, what I'm saying here is India's trade deficit with these particular countries was, right, this number, whatever the number you do not have to mug up, right, it was this much in the financial year 11. And by financial aid 21, this has actually ballooned. It has actually increased to a very large margin. Now, I am saying do not mug up these particular numbers. By the time you write the exam, the numbers would have already changed. That is the reason you do not have to mug up these numbers. All you can simply say is, before signing these particular agreements, yes, there is a trade deficit. India signed these agreements. We expected the trade between these countries to increase. Has it increased? Yes. But what has happened is with the rise in the bilateral trade or overall trade between India and these particular trading partners, India's trade deficit also has increased during the same period of time, which essentially means India's exports are not increasing at expected level to these particular countries. Now, some of you might be thinking, sir, why is this happening in the context of India? Why our exports are not increasing so that the trade deficit will come down? Reasons are very simple. In the context of India, the cost of production is higher. Why is the cost of production higher? For example, I am a manufacturer. It is very difficult for me to find, let us say, loans at a cheaper rate of interest in India, especially for MSME sector. Even if I find a loan or a credit in the market, I am forced to pay a higher rate of interest on these particular loans, which will have a direct impact on what is the cost of product. So, cost of production are higher. Cost of electricity that is used for production is higher. Cost of logistics is higher. 
and a result of these plus many other factors, our exports are not very competitive in the international market. And that is the precise reason why we are unable to leverage these particular trade agreements. Now, what is the way forward here? Government of India simply has stated that we want to review these particular trade agreements where our trade deficit is actually increased over a period of time. And that is what is discussed in this particular article here. Done? So, based on the discussion, I have given a question here. Consider the following statements. PTA and FTA both cover substantial trade. Statement is wrong. PTA covers a very small part of the trade, whereas a free trade agreement covers a substantial amount of the trade. Under FTA, the trading partners reduce both tariff as well as non-tariff barriers. Now, some of you here will simply say, Sir, in my book, it simply says the FTA is focused on the tariff barrier reduction. Yes, it is true. But if you see the government documents which are published, right, there is an uh, FAQs on the trade agreements which has been published by the government. And in these particular documents, clearly the government states that the objective of FTA is that the trading partners will try to reduce both the tariff as well as a non-tariff barrier. So, I will go with the government document here and say second statement is true, right option is option B, only two. Next article, very, very important, India, UAE, Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. Now, what are the important points here? Right? Focus on the most important points. Just now we have discussed that CAPA is a step further or step above the concept of a simple FTA. And when you talk about CEPA, you are focused on goods, you are focused on services, you are focused on other areas such as investment, intellectual property rights, digital trades, right, etc. And that is why this particular agreement is very, very important for you. First and foremost, what has been proposed under the agreement, what has been provided in the article here, right? It has been provided that United Arab Emirates, UAE, will be reducing the tariff or eliminating the tariffs on around 90 percentage of the goods that are exported from India. And in return, India would be reducing the tariff on 65 percentage of, right, the goods that are imported from India. UAE. So, there is a reciprocity here. There is a reciprocal reduction in the tariff or elimination in the tariffs by both of the countries. Now, what is the advantage of this? The advantage of this is initially to begin with in the next five years, we will try to increase the bilateral trade that is conducted between both of these particular countries. And the investment target or uh, to be more precise here, the bilateral trade target has been set at 100 billion dollars in the next five years, 100 billion dollars. And understand this, in addition to this, in addition to this, as per the data given in the article, because of this particular agreement, 10 million jobs would be created, right? Rather than 10 million, it is 10 lakh. Just make a correction here, 10 lakh jobs would be created only in India because of this particular agreement. That's the second point. And over a period of time, UAE has stated that we will reduce or we will eliminate the tariffs on most of the imports that we do from India. And in the next 10 years, India would be reducing and eliminating the tariffs on around 90 percentage of the goods that are imported from United Arab Emirates. This is the third point. Fourth point, have a look at this. We will be importing 200 tons of gold from UAE. Is it okay? We will be importing 200 tons of gold, that is a precious metal from UAE. And please understand this. Whatever imports we are going to do from UAE under this, up to 200 tons, we are going to reduce the tariff on this by 1 percentage. Is it okay? We are going to reduce the tariff by 1 percent, that is whatever is the tariff we are importing on, let's say, the gold imports, whatever it is, on this particular import from UAE, we will apply 1 percentage less on that. But this particular limit is only applicable up to 200 tons of import of gold. Sir, what will happen if I import more than 200 tons? In that particular case, we will simply increase the tariff and apply whatever is the normal tariff applicable on the import of gold. Done? 
right that is one more very important point here now why this agreement makes a lot of sense for india have a look at this this is the first comprehensive trade agreement that the current government of india has signed in the last 6 to 7 years first very very important comprehensive agreement i can understand this that's the first point second point strict rules of origin will be applicable in this particular agreement now you will simply raise a question sir what do you mean by strict rules of origin here let me give a very simple example imagine trade is being conducted between a b and a and c so from c certain exports are entering into a from b same exports are entering into a imagine this particular marker c is exporting this marker to a and b is also exporting the same or similar marker to a now let's say a and b enter into an agreement and as a result of this we will reduce the tariff on the marker to let's say 0% now earlier imagine it was 15% now it has been reduced to 0% so if this particular marker is exported from b to a what will be the tariff applicable 0% and a similar marker exported from c to a the tariff would be 15% so there is always a danger that a manufacturer from c will export these particular markers to country b and from country b he will simply route it he will simply right send these particular exports from country b to country a to enjoy this particular benefit of the exemption of tariffs or 0% tariffs now the whole objective of agreement between a and b was that both of the country should benefit but in this particular case a manufacturer from some other country the third country is gaining the benefit of this agreement between a and b now to overcome this particular issue government has introduced the concept of rules of origin and this is not a new thing please remember this here is your homework in 2020 government of india introduced something called as karotar rules 2020 please find out what is the long form of this karotar rules of 2020 and i'll give a hint this particular rule is basically connected to concept of rules of origin and very often this is cited in the newspaper now please understand the concept of rules of origin is not anything new it was there in the context of rcep it has been there in the context of many of the trade agreements that india has been signing or has been implementing this concept up the argument here is whenever this particular marker imagine this particular marker will move from country b to country a now the government of india before allowing the marker to land will ask for proof of documentation is it okay they will ask for a proof or a document which will simply say that certain value addition has happened in the country b and it has not been merely imported from country c to b and then exported to country a have you understand this this particular marker imagine if it is manufactured in country c it doesn't have to go under under or it doesn't have to undergo any kind of manufacturing country b as such it will be simply imported then routed to country a like this but what if there is certain value addition certain manufacturing which has happened in country b will that product be allowed to enjoy this particular 0% tariff rate definitely yes but for that the government simply says in this particular agreement country b will have to prove that 40% value addition has actually happened in country b and how does the exporter for from country b will will prove that the government of country b will provide a certificate to him is it okay a document will be provided this particular document will be submitted by this exporter to the government of a and only and only then the tariff which is 0% in this case will be applied on this otherwise government of a could simply apply 15% tariff even though it is coming from country b so strict rules of origin 40% value addition remember that third one chapters on digital trade government procurement and intellectual property rights have been included for the first time ever in the agreement very very important remember this having said so next point is also very important imagine right government of india introduces certain government procurement policy and uae says that it is against this particular chapter in this particular agreement can united arab emirates file a complaint against india under wto as per the agreement no i can understand as per the agreement no it has been introduced just for negotiation purposes just to show the willingness that india is ready to discuss these kinds of concepts in the agreement but right now as per the agreement 
the other trading partner is not allowed to file a complaint against India under WTO if they violate or if their policies are against any of these particular provisions as such. And finally, India has imposed a tariff of 10% to protect sensitive sectors. What is the importance here? There are certain sensitive, se sensitive sectors in India. Now you will start asking me, sir, what are these particular sensitive items or sensitive sectors? The list is provided here. Vegetables, fruits, dairy, cereals, automobiles, auto paths, etc. And government of India feels that I cannot allow the imports from UAE to come at zero rate to, right? Or I cannot allow the imports to come into India at zero percent tariff as such. Because these are very, very important areas for us. A lot of livelihoods depend from production activity happening in these particular areas. So I will not allow duty free imports to come into India under these particular sectors. So government of India has continued to keep these particular sensitive sectors in mind has imposed 10% tariffs on these particular items. So these are some of the very very important provisions or the points related to India UAE CEPA. Next article the fair price shop as well as financial services. First and foremost under NFSA National Food Security Act right we have implemented this. And we have set up a public distribution system wherein we have set up fair price shops and the beneficiaries will go to this particular fair price shop, provide the identification and get the subsidized food grains. That is the importance of fair price shops in India. And there are more than 5 lakh fair price shops in India which are basically catering or providing the subsidized food grains under NFSA to more than 80 crore people in India. Now, in addition to this, there is also a concept of the common service centers, CSCs, common service centers. And what is the importance of these particular common service centers? A common man who wants to get details regarding a particular scheme and he wants to know whether he is eligible for this particular scheme or not. A person wants to apply for a PAN card. A person wants to apply for, let's say, Aadhaar, etc. There are so many financial services that are needed by a common man. They can get all of these particular services at these particular common service centers. And understand this, over 3 lakh common service centers have been set up in India. And 8,000 out of them are basically connected with a fair price shop in India. Is it okay? Around 8,000 of them are connected, are joined with fair price shops in India. Sir, what do you mean by this? Imagine this is a fair price shop which is also providing the services under common service center. That is the facilities related to CSE are also provided here. So if I am a beneficiary under NFSA, I can go to the shop, get my ration and at the same point of time, imagine I want to apply for a PAN card, I can apply at the same fair price shop. So these particular FPS, right, provide the services of ration, Plus, they will also provide the services which are associated with common service centers. And what is the importance of this? The importance of this is, these particular FPS essentially are the places where the people, that is the beneficiaries, come on monthly basis to avail the services. So these are one of the last points of providing services in case of a rural India. And imagine if these particular FPS starts providing more and more financial services to the people like this. What will be the advantage here? One, it will promote financial inclusion. Is it okay? It will promote financial inclusion. And second, whenever this particular FPS will provide the services under CSC, they will charge a certain amount of money. So they will be able to earn additional amount of income, which will provide them with more incomes that will help them to sustain these particular services. Right? So these are some of the advantages that have been attached to the combination of FPS as well as CSE. Now, in recent times, the government has stated that around 8,000 right, CSEs are attached to FPS. We want to expand and we want to ensure that in the next one year, 10,000 more CSEs will be attached to the FPS. That is, these particular FPSs will provide the ration also and will provide the financial services under CSE also. In addition to this, government also has identified these particular FPS under Pradhanamantri Mudra Yojana, PMMY, 
under Pradhan Mantri Mudra Yojana, wherein they can take loans and set up infrastructure facility. Is okay? Set up infrastructure facility and start selling agriculture as well as non-agriculture common goods to the people, which will further supplement their source of revenue, source of income. So these are some of the very important points related to the FPS as well as financial services given in this particular article. Next, monetization goal of government of India. I am pretty sure in the last couple of months, you people have been reading about national monetization pipeline. NMP, National Monetization Pipeline. Even in the survey, this has been mentioned. Now, under the National Monetization Pipeline, Government of India has set up a target of generating or raising 6 lakh crore rupees. Okay, 6 lakh crore rupees by 2024-25. And, right, starting from 21-22, what are the targets in each of the year? They have been mentioned here. Should you mug up? Absolutely no. Don't mug up. But need to remember that annually government of India has set up certain amount of money to be raised under the national monetization pipeline. First point. Second important point. Under NMP, many of the sectors are covered where government of India wants to monetize the projects, brownfield projects mind you, and generate this particular money. And most important sectors, I'll focus on the top three, railways, roads, and power sector. Okay, railways, roads and power sector. And if you can see this, the railways has a target of monetizing around 1.5 lakh crore rupees. Just above 1.5 lakh crore rupees. That would be approximately more than 25 percentage of total value of national monetization pipeline target itself. Now what does the target or what does the article say about this particular monetization pipeline? The article simply says that in the railway sector, there are various issues which are going to hinder the process of monetization for the year 2021 as well as 2022-23. That is for the current year, the target is around 88,000 crores. Because of slower pace of monetization within the railways, this particular target will not be met. And again, I am not saying this, the article is saying this. And the second, 2023, the monetization target is around 1.6 lakh crore rupees. Right? Again, because of the railways, it says that because of this, we will not be able to meet the target even in the next financial year. And maybe after this, that is in the 23, 24 and 24 and 25, the pace of monetization in the railways will pick up. And as a result of this, we will be able to raise a lot of money under the national monetization pipeline goal as such. So this is the gist of the article. Now again, technical aspects are given. Right? Some of you might be thinking, sir, you are simply saying there is going to be delay. But why is there going to be delay? Then you will have to understand the infrastructure development process. Right? Why infrastructure delay happens in India? What is happening in the context of the railway roads? Why there is a delay, etc. Which is not required for UPC. Whatever I have discussed, more than sufficient for the exam. The next article is related to new banking lot of technical aspects have been provided in the article. The article headline is a Neo Banking Platform, Neo, raises 100 million in Series C. So should you read this particular article? No. Then you will simply ask me a question, sir, if I am not supposed to read the article, why have you given it in the first place? For a very simple reason of this term, Neo Banking. They have mentioned this particular term, Neo Banking. Very, very new concept in India. You must have heard of payment banks, small finance banks, right? RRBs, cooperative banks, etc. To this particular growing list of the banks in India, there is a new term. Mind you, I am using, using the term, a new term. It's not a bank. I'll come to that in a minute. There is a new term that you need to understand now, concept of neo banking. Neo banks are also referred to as a challenger banks. Remember this. Neo banks are also referred to as challenger banks. Why? In the last couple of years, especially post 2017, there has been a rise of the concept of neo banking in India. And these are giving a very tough competition, at least on the face of it, are going to give a very tough competition to traditional banking sector. And that is the precise reason these are referred as a challenger banks. Now you will start asking the question, sir, what do you mean by neo banking? First tell me that. Let's start. Neo banks are essentially fintech platforms or fintech firms 
which basically provide banking services through a platform or through app. Is it okay? I'll repeat the statement here. Neo banks are essentially financial technology firms or fintech firms, companies, which are providing the banking services through a platform or through an app. But please understand this, these are not banks. These are not recognized as banks. Now you are confused. You will say, sir, just some seconds ago you said they provide banking services. Now you are saying these are not banks. How is that possible? Let me answer that. Here is a bank, let's say State Bank of India. With State Bank of India, this particular company, Neo, has had a tie-up. There is a tie-up or an agreement between both of them. And the banking services, right, which are provided by SBI, similar banking services are provided by NEO. But please understand this. This particular company which is quoted here, NEO, right, and there are many. There is EP5, Wazir, etc. Right, so there are many of these. Understand this. These are able to provide these kinds of banking services, such as, let's say, loans, only when they enter into a tie-up with a traditional bank. I can understand. Well, only when they enter into a tie-up with a traditional bank, they are allowed to provide these kinds of banking services. For example, if you look at this particular paragraph, NEO, this particular company, has had a tie-up with Yes Bank, ICICI Bank, SBM Bank, DCB, Equitas, Equitas, Small Finance Bank. So only when they have a tie-up with these particular traditional banks, I can understand because traditional banks are present in the form of branches, in the form of a digital banking services also. Whereas uh, NEO will only provide these kinds of banking services in a digital platform or through an app. They do not have a physical branch. Remember this. These do not have a physical branch. These essentially provide these kinds of banking services. For example, one could be involved in providing loans. Another could be involved in providing the forex reserves related services. That is exchange related services, etc. So there is a very limited type of a service, but these are banking services. And these are going to be provided by these particular fintech platforms after they enter into a tie-up or an agreement with a traditional bank like this. And because of the higher penetration of internet connectivity, more and more usage of mobiles, that is the smartphones in India, it is stated that these particular neo banks will be able to leverage this particular penetration of technology as well as mobile banking or let's say the, the uh, smartphone usage in India and they will be able to provide more and more services, capture more and more customers right, within the Indian market itself. And that is the precise reason these are referred to as challenger banks. Okay, That is the precise reason these have been referred to as challenger banks. Done? So these are some of the very important concepts related to neo banking. And remember this, these are not banks. These are not recognized as banks by RBI. They do not have any banking licenses. They do not have any banking branch also. Right? Essentially, they enter into agreement, start providing certain types of bank services to other customers in the market. Done? So this is the discussion related to neo banking. Now, based on this, I have given a question here. Consider the following statements. Neo banks are recognized as banks by RBI and are registered under Schedule 2 of RBI Act. This is a misleading statement, but this is wrong. Now, why I have given this particular statement? Because generally when you use the term neo banks, the term bank is there. And your mind automatically in the exam will tell you, right, the term bank is there. So, it means it should be a bank. And if it is a bank, it should be recognized by RBI. So, you may tend to, right, have this kind of a reason and come to a conclusion the statement is true. But no statement is wrong. They are also referred as a challenger bank. The second statement is true. Right option will be option B here. Next article, NSE and co-location. So much of discussion has been happening regarding the concept of NSE and co-location. I am not going to discuss about Yogi here. Don't worry, right? that is not important for UPSC. Don't read pages and pages about what happened between the chairman of NSE and a Yogi or a Baba, whatever it is. That is not important. Sir, then why it is being covered so much in the newspaper? Very simple. The head of NSE shared confidential information with a person who is not supposed to have access to such information. That's it. 
right that is the investigation that is happening there beyond that for upsc it has no relevance whatsoever but this particular term has suddenly popped up in the recent discussion in the current affairs that is a concept of co-location now what do you mean by co-location here co-location is essentially refers to a space or a place which is right within the nsc area is it okay nsc stock exchange area now what do you mean by this nsc right it's, it's a building national stock exchange there is a building i'm pretty sure if you have been reading the newspaper there's a very tall building with a very big neo light above that nsc which has been given in the newspapers in the last one week so that's a area that's a building okay infrastructure is there within this there are certain important servers i can understand computer servers there are important servers which are located and right within the vicinity of this particular server room there are certain spaces or there are certain areas which are referred which are referred to as co-location is it okay i'll repeat it nsc servers are there and in the surrounding area there are certain areas which are identified as co-location why these are identified as co-location very simple the traders they will have to pay a certain amount of fees and they can set up their servers or let's say their systems in this particular area have you understand this the traders especially high frequency traders hfts right or let's say uh, the hedge fund managers or hedge fund uh, the units as such they will take this particular place set up their systems there and they will have to pay a certain amount of fees to national stock exchange for having provided this particular space so remember this is co-location illegal absolutely no this is perfectly legal in nsc they started allowing co-location from the year 2009 and the scam that has been right there in the newspaper essentially is for a duration 2010 to 2014 now what is this particular scam that is associated with co-location now to understand that it's a very technical concept let me give a very simple example let me give a very simple example imagine here is a superstore in the superstore the vegetables are arranged in certain area the cereals are arranged in certain area the other food products let's say meat egg maggi biscuits or the daily usage items right which are required for household etc they are arranged in racks like this now imagine i will tell all of you within one minute you are allowed to enter into this particular superstore pick up whatever you like go to the counter right and simply bill out i will give you 50 percent discount again don't apply all of this story in upsc and just trying to make you understand what is this scam of co-location so here is the situation superstore is there i am telling you right go into this within one minute pick up whatever you want and you will have to get it billed and i will give you a 50 percent discount but within all of you people i will call let's say 50 people or let's say 10 people on the side and i'll tell you go to lane number three and in the lane number three lower shelf right a very big packet is there and the cost of that is very very high within the store itself that is a high cost community purchase that because you will get higher discount and in addition to this i will give them right uh, the the the, uh, the the basket or let's say i will give them a carrier which moves very very fast so when the doors will open these particular people will know which place to go what product to pick up and i will tell them go to counter number three the checkout or the system is very very fast there you can get it built very fast so have a look at this when this system or when when this example will happen in real life don't you think those particular 10 people who got a tip from me they will get the benefit from this that is exactly what happened in this particular co-location scam sir what do you mean by this i will tell you what happened whenever these particular servers will open up all the servers will have certain amount of information and this information is provided to the traders based on how the traders will log on to the servers i can understand this based on how the traders will log on to the servers the information will be provided to them and that is where the co-location becomes very very important because these particular traders have set up their systems in the co-location which is very very in the vicinity to the main server of nse they will be able to log on to the server much faster 
and enter into trade settlement much faster. I can understand. They will be, they'll be able to log on to the server much faster because they are very nearby to the server. Now, some of you might be thinking, sir, it doesn't make any difference. It is internet. I can get access anywhere. Yes, you are right. Absolutely right. But imagine this situation. What if I give you a mobile phone having 2G data and I have a 4G or let's say 5G data mobile phone. Both of us will open, let's say, YouTube page. Both of us will play one of my videos. In which of the systems do you think the mobile will buffer the video much faster? That is exactly what I'm saying. The traders will have access to these particular NAC servers, but they are spread throughout India. But here, here are certain amount of traders, a number of traders who are set up very close to this particular location of a server. They will log on to the server very, very soon. They will get the first access to information. They will settle the trades much faster. Even a millisecond is more than sufficient for them to gain from this particular trading as such. Sir, what is a scam here? Scam is very simple. I told you many servers are there. Data will be provided based on at what time the traders will log in. There are, again, this is an allegation. right? The allegation is that there was a tip-off. Is it okay? Or there was a tip which was given to some of these particular traders as to which server will open at what time. And they were able to log on to this particular server, place the, uh, the, the, uh, the trades much faster and they were, be, they were able to make huge amount of a profit as such. And this is essentially the concept of NAC and co-location scam. Done? Beyond this, don't try to read about a tick by tick method, right, etc, etc. All those are very technical aspects related to the trading as such. And the last concept for the day, Russia, Ukraine and the impact of this. I'm pretty sure all of you have seen the explain session in the last Friday where there was a discussion about Russia and Ukraine. What is the issue all about? If not, please visit our YouTube channel and have a look at that particular video. Now, in this particular video, I will not discuss the aspect of that. I will not discuss historical issue, etc. I am only focused on what is the likely impact of this on the global trade as well as the domestic trade. First and foremost, the crude oil prices have already overshot. Is it okay? The crude oil prices have already overshot more than $100 per barrel. And if the situation continues right now because of the elections, you might not see a rise in the, the fuel prices in the domestic market. But guaranteed, if the situation sustains like this, crude oil prices remains very, very high. In the coming days, the fuel prices, the retail fuel prices will rise. Sir, can you give us a date? March 10th. Okay. So, fuel prices in the retail market are going to rise up like this. And in addition to this, government of India stated, we might use the reserves that we have set up, okay, right? We have strategic reserves. We might use this particular reserves and it is not the first time. Last year also, we have already used the reserves to cool the retail prices in the domestic market. And if the crude oil prices will start rising, second impact will be the current account deficit will start increasing, right? And we are seeing that many of these particular foreign investors are taking out their money from India already. And in the coming month, if Federal Reserve again revises or increases the Fed rate, expect that there will be a huge amount of a foreign investment outflow or capital outflow from India. And that will lead to depreciation of the domestic currency, depreciation of Indian rupee, which again will lead to higher cost of imports, which will again lead to higher cost of imports. So these are some of the likely impacts that are going to happen on the domestic market. On the international front, the trade will be disrupted. The international trade is going to be disrupted. There are many, many important passages here, right? The routes which are taken for transportation, etc. So, international trade would be disrupted. The cost of international freight transportation, freight transportation will increase and that will again have an impact on the recovery in the global market as well as the domestic market. And understand this, India and Russia have certain amount of a trade relation. This particular trade relation will become or will be under stress. If more economic sanctions are imposed by the Western countries on Russia, Russia will not be able to trade in dollars with other countries such as India. And that will have an impact between India as well as Russia trade. So these are some of the points of economic impact because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Now, based on this, I've given a descriptive question here. 
evaluate the likely impact of Russian invasion of Ukraine on India and the global economy in 250 words? This is one kind of a question. Or the same kind of a question could be twisted and given in a different way. Russia and Ukraine conflict may be regional, but the impact is a global. Elaborate in 250 words. So these are the various articles as well as the questions related to this particular time period of 19th to 25th February of 2022. If you like this particular initiative, please hit the like button and provide your valuable comments in the section below. If you have not yet subscribed to Baiju's exam prep IS, kindly subscribe. Thank you. Have a great day.